Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, Ad Nauseam listeners, to episode 85 of the podcast. As always, my name is Dr. David C. Noe, and I'm here in the vomitorium with Dr. Jeffrey T. Winkle. How are you, Jeff? I'm feeling good this morning. It's still this morning, isn't it? Here yes, we it are? is. Yeah, yes. Absolutely. I mean, it's a late, late morning, but I'm feeling good. Sun's out. I saw Swan Carlos on the way in, <laughs> which, always, which always is a good omen. You're going to take credit for that pun of mine, aren't I, you? I'm not. I, I enjoy it so much. Think of it as an homage. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah, so, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Here we are in uh, Vomitorium East mm-hmm. next to the lake. It's been a little humid. Yeah. Right. But Michigan weather, always so interesting. Interesting, unpredictable. Yes. Yeah. Rainstorm came through last night and you could feel the humidity drop. Yeah. Right. Like I used to say in the classroom, it's so quiet in here, you could hear a grade drop. <laughs> <laughs> How did the students respond to that? Did you, ever, did you ever get anything? I never got anything. It, it continued to be that silent. It continued to be silent. <laughs> of course, I was just making a joke, but I didn't let on with my face. And so they just increased the level of terror. Right. I, I remember hearing about that from students. I, by and large, students loved you. Right. But one of the things they always kind of puzzled is they never knew how to read you. Because right. you, would, you would say all these things and just keep kind of a stone face. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like to be mysterious that <laughs> yeah. way, wrapped in an enigma, wrapped in a vest. <laughs> Exactly. But you're doing well. You're ready to uh, uh, talk some Virgil? You know, I'm, t- I'm always ready to talk some Virgil. Okay. Here, yeah. So, uh, uh, no shout out today? No, I guess people are presumably listening to what we're saying, but they don't want to be recognized for their accomplishment, you know, yeah. waiting through 45 minutes to an hour of this drivel. They don't want to receive any kind of recognition. Okay. And I- I'm okay with that. I mean, I think that many of our listeners are probably a little bit more reserved and shy. I was thinking, you know, uh, think of myself in the classroom back in the day. All right. If we think of these of these um, episodes as kinds of, of you know friendly lectures, right? Um, you know, how were you in the classroom? Were you always gun in your hand up with your opinion? Oh yeah. Were you really? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I was uh, giving my opinion even without raising my hand. <laughs> you were just shouting it out in there. I told you about the philosophy professor I had who whipped a piece of chalk at me one time. Oh, you, you did tell me about That's that. That's right, because he was. Uh, not pleased with my vociferous insouciance. Really? Yeah. Yes. I, he missed, though. I'm, I'm guessing that guy didn't have a good arm. No, he whacked me right in the head. I've really? N- I've never been the same. He was dead on, <laughs> right? So I was more of kind of the hang back and wait for my wait for my spot kind Sitting of Sitting in the back with the cool kids? With the cool kids, right? In the, the back of the bus, back of the classroom. So maybe I have more of an affinity with the people who are like, maybe. Oh, I want to hang back. I was a bit of a pain. I think one of the things that I like to do is like a parlor trick is that if a professor said something, I would try to remember the exact phrasing. Yeah. And then when he or she finished the end of their lecture, I would say, now, Professor so-and-so, about four and a half minutes ago, you said, and then I would repeat it verbatim and ask them to interact with it. Ah, okay. And that always threw them way off. Yeah. Because someone's actually listening, you know? (laughs) I wasn't really listening. I was just, but, but sometimes it was a legitimate question. Sometimes it was just kind it of. It was more of a, I want to, it was a gotcha moment. Yeah, it was a little bit of pokey. Gotcha. Right? I outgrew that. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, at least I was paying attention. Right. So. Right, right. No, I would, you know, as a, as a professor, I'd, I'd much rather have someone just shouting things out. And, oh, yes. And even if they're kind of missing the mark. Than oh, just, sure. Than just kind of sitting there stoically. Waiting. Like, waiting or, you know, looking at their phone or whatever, you know, the the, uh, the complete opposite extreme. Right, right. So, right. so no shout out is what we're saying, basically. No, sh- no shout out. Yeah, right. if you want one, contact us. Because yeah. we, you know, you are the interesting ones, you audience members. We want to talk about you. Right, right. We're friendly guys. Yeah. Just, just drop us a note. One of us at least. One of us. Okay. Right. So you've got the opening quote this week, don't you? I do. I read this article um, earlier this week in preparation for um, our topic today. You prepare for these? I prepare. Sometimes I do. Yeah, this happened to be one of those times. Well, All right. Well, we'll see how it goes. Um, and this comes from an article uh, entitled Deception and Sacrifice in Aeneid, Book 2, Lines 1 through 249 by one Rebecca Smith came out about 20 years ago in the American Journal of Philology. All right. And um, what does Rebecca say? What does Dr. Smith have to say? She says, uh, it is my purpose here in her article to consider two scenes together, Sinon's lying tale and Loacoan's death. Two episodes we hope two episodes within the text we hope to cover today. That's right. The many ironies and reversals of expectation in the passage have been extensively discussed, including trickery and sacrifices, dominant themes and Loacoan's death as, in a sense, a completion of Sinon's lying tale. 
But a closer look at precisely how the theme of sacrifice runs through the passage will show that Virgil shaped the Sinan and Laocoon episode to be a story of the systematic perversion of religious sacrifice, a perversion, furthermore, that turns at every stage on the perversion of human knowledge. Nowhere is the goal, execution, or outcome of ritual sacrifice what it ought to be. And while sacrifice is prompted by unholy human ends and turned into a violent portent by the gods, human awareness throughout the episode is both prominently at issue and helplessly deceived. Huh. Right. That is really interesting. Yeah. And I and having read the article and then reading the passage, I had not noticed the kind of you know, again how deep these layers right. go. I mean, I've noticed that too as we've, we've started for me this is a, a kind of a grand rereading of the of the Aeneid, which I've been away from it probably about ten years oh now. Oh my goodness. And just knowing all these many layers uh, to um, Virgil's style and his arrangement um, and his positioning of episodes. It just, it's extraordinary. And mm. I think, I think Ms. Smith here kind of puts her finger on one of these things. Right. Well, yeah. I liked especially this quote, and it's so obviously true, though I hadn't considered it before, that there is a systematic perversion of religious sacrifice. Yes. And that this depends upon, it turns at every stage, she says, on the perversion of human knowledge. Mm hmm. So human knowledge is warped toward unsavory ends, and that has its consequence yes. in the, the twisting or perversion of religious sacrifice. Right. That is very insightful. I think so, too. I, you know, in the earlier episodes, um, we've talked about uh, you know, Virgil presenting kind of Greek treachery. Right. As this kind of deep moral failing, mm -hmm. right? And I think this is this is just a another level of that. And I think we we see that in uh, with with the Trojan horse and with Sinon's role in this um, kind of uh, Ulysses kind of backdoor dealings and his using of his matus for these uh, kind of these uh, um, treacherous ends. Definitely, as kind of the the deep depths of these moral failings. Definitely, yeah. All right, Dave, we're about to dig back into the Aeneid here. But yes. before we do so, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, LLPSI. Yeah, so that stands for Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata. And this is the Latin course I have developed based on the famous textbook by Orberg. So you go, you go to latinperdm.com slash LLPSI, and you can sign up for my course. It's $199 for Unit 1. This is Chapters 1 through 9. I take you through the text through a series of instructional videos, plus you can download uh, my audio reading of the first nine chapters, either chapter by chapter or the whole thing together if you got a couple hours to, you know, walk around your neighborhood and listen to some Latin. And you can start this anytime. You're not, this is not arranged on like a That's sem correct. semesterly basis or anything like That's that. That's right. right? It's okay. self-paced like the Moss Method, but mm -hmm. I'm guiding you through it. So you can begin uh, right now if you want to. Excellent. And so that's uh, $199. That's right. And just say the website one more time. Latinperdm.com slash LLPSI. Don't to delay. All right. So what we're going to give the audience today, Jeff, mm -hmm. is uh, we're going to provide them with a close look, complete with a little artistic discussion about the Laocoon group, uh, a clip from a famous British comedy from oh, the yeah. early 80s, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a little reading of Latin, and some more discussion of Sinon and that's the Greek actor, and Laokouan, the Trojan priest who gets eaten alive by snakes. And uh, this will take us through a about the first half of book two. Do you think we're actually going to get there? Do no you, way. Do you think we're actually going to actually get out of book one in this episode? I, I don't know. <laughs> this stuff is just so deliciously riveting. I, you is. know, I can't move away from it. It's like when you got a giant plate of nachos. Yeah. Right? And you've got the... You got the nachos and the cheese, maybe a little ground beef sprinkled in there. You've right. got the guacamole and the sour cream on the side. And, uh, you know, you're, you're going to watch the game or something, and you think, after this savory delight, I'm going to have a little bit of ice cream. Yeah. I'll polish it off with something <laughs> sweet, right? Yeah. But you never get to it because the nachos are just overwhelming. Exactly. It's just piled so high. That's right. That's right. You have that experience sometimes? <laughs> I, think of a, I think of a lot of things in my life in terms of nachos. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So we're going to we got to start today because we didn't even get to wrap up book one last no, time. Right? No. So uh, to pick it up where we left off, uh, uh, listeners will remember that uh, Virgil tells us that um, Venus, the mother of Aeneas, has right. wrapped Aeneas and a few a handful of his men that have washed ashore here in a mist. And they've made them they've made their way down to the rising uh, city of Carthage. Yes. To check things out. And um, they observe the um, the the, uh, the 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 paintings, the the um, depictions of the Trojan War. They see themselves. Right. They're moved to tears. Yeah. The the Moenia Surgunt. Right. Happy are those whose walls are already rising. Right. Right. So another kind of melancholy, deep melancholy moment for our our hero here. Yes. Um, but we're gonna pick it up here where Dido, Queen Dido, um, enters, 
And I think it's fascinating how Virgil describes her. And, and it's, I think, very much specifically designed to remind us of how he just described Venus. Correct. He describes her as Diana. She comes, um, you know, striding and wearing a quiver. Right. Um, and I think that adds all, all kinds of interesting layers of, uh, I think he wants us to kind of compare those scenes. Yes. And so, ver- as we'll see, Venus is very interested in Dido falling for Aeneas mm-hmm. on a romantic, uh, you know, the physical level. As a way to protect him. Yeah. Yes. That is, that Venus wants to protect her son Aeneas against Carthaginian aggression. Right. By having a romance formed. Exactly. Exactly right. So I think that in some ways having Dido um, remind Aeneas, at least on some level, of his mother. You know, this mm-hmm. mother that he complains about, you know, well, you do this every time. You know, I, I, get, a, I get a little a bit of you and then you disappear. Right. Um, and Why get, can't we talk face to face like people? Right. And so I think even that kind of, uh, it, 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 uh, it stirs up a longing right. um, just on first sight. Yes. And part of the brilliance here, I may say, is that... Aeneas and Akates are wrapped in the cloud, right? Mm-hmm. Fidus Akates, faithful Akates. And they, are, they approach to the place where Dido is standing, but no one can see them. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, uh, the companions arrive. So these, yes. are, these are men from Aeneas' ship that he thought were lost, but they, they weren't lost. They washed up on shore just like he did. So Virgil's genius is he makes, um, he makes Aeneas into the audience for the scene, and then we are allowed to watch the scene through Aeneas's eyes. Yes, yeah, yeah, and that's a that's a layer again that I don't think you really see in Homer. No, you don't. No, it's I, so I think there's I more. Well, well, if I may, yeah, with, please, with please. the exception of um, Odysseus at the hut of Eumaeus, mm. which I think is around book fourteen of the Odyssey, because then you get the understanding of what it would be like to witness Telemachus and Eumaeus with the. With the reunion, and you see it through Odysseus's eyes in disguise, but it isn't exactly the same. No, you're right. You're right. This is, um, I mean, it, this is Aeneas in disguise, but it's, a, it's, he's completely hidden. Correct. Right. And so that adds a, a, a kind of a narrative nuance that I think definitely that, that we, we don't see. A, certainly, we don't see a lot of in Homer. No, it's sophisticated. It's a common plot device, I would say, in other literature. Sure. And uh, it's very clever. Sure. Sure. So uh, yes, yeah, so we sees his men, and um, I think that, you know, he he rejoices in the fact that. Um, you know, he not all is lost, right? Um, but then, um, then Aeneas appears. You know, right. Venus removes the mist, and it's like this this magic trick being being displayed here. Yeah. So uh, to vanish into thin air, right? Mm-hmm. That, that's an expression that we can find in Virgil, a uh, to mm-hmm. vanish into thin air from Ewanesco. But now we have the opposite. Yeah. He is appearing out of out thick of thin air, out of thick air. Say. Right. Right. Uh, let me just read Lombardo's translation here, which. Um, I love his rendering here. Uh, it's, he says, He had scarcely finished when the enveloping cloud parted and dissolved into thin air. There stood Aeneas, gleaming in the clear light, his face and shoulders like a god's. His mother breathed upon him the radiance of youth, breathed glory on his hair, and she gave his eyes an exultant luster like the sheen of hand-rubbed ivory or parian marble or silver set in gold. Oh, very nice. How do you like your ivory? Um, I like it, well... I'm, I'm polished. Mach- machine rubbed or hand rubbed? I, I, I'm, I'm more comfortable with machine rubbed. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Or, or maybe just a light polish. A light polish. Yeah, yeah. A little about, bit of an end dust, that lemony smelly yeah, stuff. I, I, don't need, I don't need much there. How, about, no. how do you feel about your... your... Well, I, I assume this is elephant, I, elephant ivory, mm-hmm. uh, but I know ivory is extracted from the tusks of boars. That's not so uncommon at this time period. Right. Probably maybe walrus. I don't know. Um, I don't have a full taxonomy of ivory here for you. <laughs> a, uh, a a ratio eborum, something like that. Mm. But I think if you if you uh, polish it, it gets a little bit of that yellow luster because um, ivory tends to yellow over time. It yes. oxidizes. So if you polish it, it removes a little bit of that yellow luster and, and makes it kind of shine. Right, right. I was at a local museum not so long ago, and they had some scrimshaw. Oh, oh scrimshaw. Just, yeah, exactly. Which, which, I, I like that word. That's whale baleen. That's the jaw of a whale. Yes. Uh, um, and it had been carved right, and, right into, into kind of a narrative scene, but it had uh, kind of turned that kind of that yellow that you're yes. just describing. I think that's inc- I think Scrimshaw it, total digression, but I think Scrimshaw is amazing as well. You think about these guys on these boats, these whaling ships and other boats, fighting off scurvy. Their teeth are falling out. Yeah. Someone give me an orange. What are they gonna do? Right? <laughs> yeah. They grab a bit of the whale jaw and they carve these beautiful, elaborate uh, scenes. It's quite remarkable. I just find I think Scrimshaw. That's the only thing that word. Re- 
uh, can describe, right? Mm, isn't it a Is basketball it? term as well? Scrimshaw? Yeah. Like how, he, how so? he went to the post and scrimshaw. He, he scrimshaw like, like he pivoted toward yeah, the basket? Yeah, sunk a three. <laughs> I, I stand correct. All right. Right. Exactly. Someday we'll talk about the difference between flotsam and jetsam. All right. This, this is not the place. Right. So Aeneas ap- appears, and, I, and this is a Homeric touch, uh, just like uh, Athena does to Odysseus when you know Odysseus encounters Calypso, when Odysseus you know appears before um, uh, the folks on Ithaca for the first time. She makes him look a little bit better than he actually does. Right. She uses a, it would be like a filter today. That's right. right? You know that's really interesting. I don't really use any filters, but I understand what they are for, Mm -hmm. right? Adjust the lighting, give you cat ears, something like that. Exactly. That is precisely what she does for Aeneas. Right. Yes. Later, she will do the same for Dido uh, when they fall in love. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, uh, and that must be book four. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, And to compare Venus and Minerva, uh, uh, Aphrodite and Athena here, this is something right much more up Venus's alley. Oh yeah, like, you know, making making your appearance uh, pop, right. right? And so she she would have a, uh, uh, I think, a, a much uh, easier hand at this than Athena would. Mm, so what, there, is, yeah. what what is Venus's plan here? What's driving her? All right. So why is she doing this? So why does she want um, you know Aeneas and Dido to get together? Well, she's worried that um, you know, Juno, if, if our listeners will remember, is on the side of these Phoenicians, these these Car- Carthaginians or Carthaginians to be. Because she hates the Trojans generally. Yes. Juno hates the Trojans. Right. Does not want Aeneas and his men to get to Italy. Right. Um, though they are fated to do so, and Virgil has told us early on. And so um, Venus is afraid that Juno will incite the Phoenicians uh, against Aeneas and his men, uh, take them out. And so she is intent on making this at least... Um, in the, in the meantime, in the, in the short term, a love match between them. Yeah. So Juno has a plan too, right? Venus's plan is to protect Aeneas and Juno's plan is to destroy him. Yes. But they reach a kind of detente, right? They're going to work together temporarily to protect both of their interests. Yeah. And this never works. Of course not. Right. You can't have two goddesses uh, trying to achieve different ends no. on a team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think the the uh, I think the the process by which Venus kind of takes up her side of the of the story I think is really interesting. Okay, because I think he she could have easily and the story could have easily have been she makes Aeneas look really good she makes Dido look very good they're drawn together and they kind of fall for each other that way but that's not how she does it. No, right? She does it through what some people might find a surprising means. She takes uh, the son Ascanius. And she spirits him away to one of her safe houses. One of her safe houses. It's on Crete, I think. I think, yes, exactly. And hides him away. Deposits him there and then replaces him with a kind of uh, um, android, right? It is Cupid, her own son, Mm -hmm. in disguise. Yeah, which is really quite, I think it's quite strange. One of the things as I was looking through this I wanted to ask you is, why do you think she does this rather than just having those, make those two crazy kids fall in love with each other? Why bring the kid into it? What's going on? Well, one idea that occurs to me is that just like the bribe that Juno made to Aeolus mm-hmm. for the nymph Deopea, you know, uh, more beautiful than all the other nymphs, Pulcherimaforma, I think was the phrase. The bribe there, remember, was a Roman family kind of bribe. Yes. It yeah. wasn't just lust. It was you can have this consummately beautiful nymph and she'll make you a father of fine children. Right. So I think that part of the Roman ethos is that all of these things are seen in the context of extending one's family. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so bringing in the boy, right? Can, can, Aeneas, can Aeneas really love Dido if Dido does not love his son? Right. He can't fulfill his role as a Pius Aeneas founding the, the dynasty if his love interest hates the child of his former uh, of his former wife. Yeah. So it's not an evil stepmother kind of... Uh, theme it's the reverse of that right and i think it's one of the things that makes it extra surprising exactly now i was thinking about this more like i'm not as kind of broad i think you're 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 tying that into kind of the roman kind of cultural value is really interesting and i'm very persuaded by that my my observation was much more on a personal level so um aeneas's wife has died in the mm-hmm. fall of troy his son survives um, Dido also, she loses her spouse, yes, but she Caius. has no children. Exactly. So in, in, I think that you know, by making you know, Amor look like Ascanius, sometimes called Ulysses in the text, 
and having him sit on Dido's lap. I think it arouses kind of those uh, kind of motherly instincts. Definitely. And it reminds her of perhaps what she longed to have with Sychaeus right. uh, back in, in Tyre. So here she has a ready-made family. Yep. Right. And I don't know a lot about this, at least not from personal experience. But my understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, is that these ready-made families, they're often a lot of trouble. Yeah. Uh, often as much trouble as the other kind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Virgil is saying here, look, th- this has... Everything's going to work out exactly like both parties want to, mm-hmm. because Dido loves Aeneas by gazing upon his son. Yes, right? looks at him, and she falls in love with him because uh, the child reminds her of Aeneas, the father. Yeah, it's a very interesting dynamic. Yeah, and and Cupid do- is doing what Cupid does, but he's not doing it in with his bow and arrow. No, it? but it's much more subtle. Yep, um, and charm, conversation, yes, gestures, glances. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And um, yes, and just to, to reiterate, it's a reversal of the whole wicked stepmother yes. motif, which does not begin with Cinderella. This goes way back. Oh, of it, course. You find it in traditions around the world. But mm-hmm. if um, listeners go back to our um, uh, Al- Alcestis episodes, oh, yes. we, we, um, one of the themes where is that Alcestis, as she's dying, she doesn't want her husband to remarry because she knows how stepmothers are. That's right. And so to have um, Dido fall for this stranger, for the stranger and for the stranger's child, I think for the an, an original audience, they would have found that very surprising and very interesting. Yes, and it also is a contrast with Juno's own behavior, because Juno is the original wicked stepmother. Right. <laughs> All of her antagonism and animosity is directed to the children of her husband, children conceived with another you know, mortal or goddess. Right, right. So, yeah. So big contrast between Dido and Juno here. Yeah. I mean, so the, all of these kind of, if you start to think about the connections between these characters and then the gods and the larger story, you really see how how complex and ornate and intricately organized this story really is. Yes. Yes. It's uh, brilliant. Yep. Jeff, before we say goodbye definitively to book one, mm-hmm. we have to touch on the uh, Jovian prophecy. Oh, yes. Take that. Yeah, take it away. Well, remember that Um, Long around line 200 in book one. This is something we just passed over quickly, but I'd like to touch on it before Mm -hmm. we move to book two. Venus comes to her father and complains, you know, why can't Aeneas just have success? And Jupiter reassures her and says, look, uh, the promises I made, he smiles down upon her. The promises I made will be kept. These things have to play out, right? Don't worry. It's all going to work out. And then he uh, lists these really famous lines. And they are, you know, destiny lines for the rest of the epic. He says, uh, this is 278. His ego nec me tas re rum nec tempora pono imperium sine fina de di. So I have placed on them, on the Romans, neither limits of uh, extent of kingdom nor any extent of time. Hmm. He says, I have given, Dedi, I have given imperium sine fina. I've given power without limit. Hmm. So this is really important in terms of guiding the destiny of the rest of the epic. Yeah. And it's also how the Romans saw themselves. Uh, the, The author, James O'Donnell, in his book on Augustine, he talks about Augustine paying off his debt to Virgil. And it was this one line which really dogged Augustine as he thought about the Roman state and its imminent collapse. Hmm. Virgil had said 400 years before, I have given them power without limit. Yes, yeah. And uh, that was proving not to be true. But all of Roman culture was um, enchanted by this idea, right? Romans were exceptional. They would never collapse. Yeah. But, of course, that's not true. Right. So I I was unaware of that. So Augustine... Was kind of haunted by that line. Absolutely. Because right. all of Roman culture was, right? Yeah. And then when Rome is sacked in 410, Augustine has to take a hard look at that. And so he starts to write, in O'Donnell's terms, he starts to write City of God to pay off his debt to Virgil, to basically say, yes, Virgil, you know, your imagination and your worldview, for lack of a better term, has controlled me and all of Roman culture ah. for 400 years. But I have to say goodbye to it because it is at some level false. Yeah. So the kind of the evaporation of the Roman dream yes, to some degree. Exactly. And Augustine, well said. Augustine himself it dies in the throes of that uh, that, that collapse, doesn't You're he? Right. Yeah. yeah. At four thirty he's laying in uh, in bed in, in Hippo. Yeah. And the vandals are sweeping across right. North Africa. So ending any Roman presence in the very place where our story takes you know, takes place. Right. Yeah. Carthage and so forth. Exactly, right. He never saw what happened in Italy that was after him. Yeah. But 
Uh, but this this is one of those ideas that just haunted all Romans. Yeah. Uh, empire without limit. Imperium sine fine de die. Yeah. I think it's also interesting how, I mean, Homer does this a bit too, but um, uh, in these lines, uh, Virgil makes Jupiter almost synonymous with fate. Yes. He's the granter of these kinds of things, rather than fate kind of sitting as this larger thing above Jupiter. I think right. Virgil does that too. Definitely. Um, but here, Jupiter basically says, I got the keys, I'm driving the car, I'll, I'll get you there. Right. Speaking yeah. of driving the car, right, from the last episode when we talked about the fates, the park eye, that's yeah. how they roll, right? <laughs> sitting in their El Camino. That's right. That's right. I forgot about the El Camino. Well, you can't forget about the El Camino. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah Zeus is driving the car right that's now. That's right. Yep. So that wraps up book one, mm-hmm. and now we move on to book two proper. Yes. So book one, it, uh, just one more thing. So before, when book one ends, uh, the Carthaginians are at a banquet with, uh, or sorry, the uh, the Trojans are at a banquet thrown and, by the and the Carthaginians. They're there too, yep. but they're the the Carthaginians are the hosts, um, and it's very similar to the end of the Phaeacian episode in um, in the Odyssey, yes. where they finally sit him down and basically say, "Hey, tell us your story, stranger." And so um, we get the same moment, and Aeneas then says, okay, I'll give you the background, and that's, right. that's what book two is. That's right. We get the whole flashback. Mm-hmm. And so it occupies all of book two and actually all of book three. That's right. Because that's right. book two is the fall of Troy, and book three is the wanderings and the cyclops and symplegades and all of that. Yeah, so roughly analogous to books nine through 12 in the Odyssey. Right. Yeah. And I love the way book two begins. Can I read a little bit of Latin here? Yeah, I think, okay? I think we're overdue. All right. Yeah. Contic away rum nesententi quora tenebant, inde tero pater ainea sic orsus abalto, in fandum regina ubes re noara dolorem, Troia nas utopeset lamentabula regnum, er werent danae quae quipsa miserima vidi, et quorum pars magna fui quistalia fondo. Nicely done. Thank you. Yeah, you want to translate those? Uh, uh, you want the Cresac here, or would you yeah, like. Let's do the Cresac, because I think right, we did some Cresac. Lombardo earlier. So here's his translation. A silence fell as they intently watched that man, Father Aeneas. From his high couch, he began. You ask me, queen, once more to dredge up grief beyond all telling, Troy destroyed, dead in its black despond. Danaeans with its stolen wealth, cruel things I saw and played my part in. Hmm. That's how he opens up the his story there. That's right. Yeah. Now, do you often uh, hold forth from a high couch? Not usually. I usually nap on it. Yeah? Yeah. So you've got the... The Toro ab alto here, from his high couch he began. So we t- I take that to mean like, it's like a place of honor at the banquet? Yes. Right. I think they're sitting at the head table, he and Dido, right? So they get served the cake first. Mm-hmm. They get the first uh, draft of champagne and so forth. Yeah. And then he looks out over the assembled Trojans and Carthaginians, and his first word is in fandom. In fandum regina ubes renoara dolorem. You bid me, queen, to dredge up. Some infandum dolorum, unspeakable grief. Yeah. Yeah. Now here, if I were to compare Aeneas and Odysseus in this same moment, uh, again, it's just the way I read it, as I think that I could see Odysseus um, saying similar kind of, maybe he even does, uh, you know, oh, this is so painful for me to talk about. Right. But he also, at the same time, relishes telling his story. Oh, he loves he it. He loves it. And here with Aeneas, I, he says, this is very painful for me to tell. I don't want to do it. And I believe him. Yes. I think that's a key, again, another one of these key differences between those characters. Definitely. Yep. Definitely. Speaking of relish. Yes. <laughs> are you ready for this? Yes. I was reading the newspaper this week in the Wall Street Journal. I don't remember what page. For some reason, A9 sticks in my mind. And they were quoting someone and the person said, I really relish in that. And I thought, that's not how that expression goes. No. You don't relish in something. No, it sounds it sounds messy. It does sound pretty <laughs> awful, doesn't it? it? Does. And it stuck out at me, the misuse of prepositions. Yeah. So I really relish in that sport. You can't relish in something. No, you, it has to have a direct object. Yes. You relish, you relish something, something. Something, right. Yeah, oh. you, you can't garnish in something, I don't think, either. <laughs> no, I don't want to do that, either. No, it really <laughs> stuck out to me. And I thought you would like it, so I, I, I inflicted it on you. I enjoy that, yes. So, in fandum dolorum, unspeakable sorrow. Aeneas does not relish these, this retelling. <laughs> he does not relish in it. No. And I love this line, too. Things that I myself saw mm-hmm. and of which I played a role. So, this is really interesting. We're getting another firsthand account. But just like Homer, who takes the listener in Medias race, as Horace says... Virgil starts us out with lots of action. We have to wait an entire book. All of book one has to be finished before we can get the flashback. Yes. Which takes us for two books. Right, 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 right. 
I have some kind of broad thoughts about book two, and I thought maybe I'd like to kind of share them to kind of start us off. Is this like a top ten? Not not really, not really a top ten, but just kind of broad themes that I noticed, and we can kind of maybe see how this plays out as okay. we go through the details. But um, I thought again, comparing this to to the Iliad, um, I, I think we we definitely see kind of a broad notion of the Greeks are. I don't want to say like the bad guys, but they are the more villainous. Uh, oh, they're the bad guys bad, in this book, yeah. right? I mean, I think it's it's less so in the Iliad, but um, I mean, I would say that in the Iliad, the Trojans are much more sympathetic, definitely, because um, they're defending their homeland uh, and, and such. But also in, in terms of kind of you know moral character as well. And I think we see a similar kind of thing here. And so I think that Virgil he, he seems to capitalize um, on the sympathy for the Trojans that's already there in Homer's Iliad. And, you know, and has kind of the extra layer that these Trojans are tied to kind of Roman destiny, and this is for a Roman audience. Um, but, you know, these Trojans, they've suffered unjustly at the hands of capricious gods, and they seem to be, you know, free of the kind of, um, you know, treacherous um, craftiness yes. that is part and parcel of the Greek character. They're, they're a simple rustic people. Right. They rose to world power accidentally. There was no cunning or shrewdness. No, no, exactly. That's how they see themselves. Yes. Um, but I thought, as I reread this, I thought that maybe Virgil also seems to be highlighting that um, that kind of guilelessness as a, as a weakness oh. that makes them too trusting, mm-hmm. and they're too simple, right. and that's why they fall into these particular traps. So it's like this idea that we we, we sympathize uh, uh, we sympathize with them because they don't have these villainous qualities of the Greeks, but because they don't have those villainous qualities. They fall prey to all these other things as yeah. well. So it reminds me of uh, this novel, The Idiot, uh, Dostoevsky's novel. Yes. And in The Idiot, you might know the the main character. I can't remember him, Prince Alyoshin or something. Got the name wrong, but um, it's an example of what would a really thoroughly nice and innocent person be like mm-hmm. if you could spend time around a person who was really deeply nice, almost perfect in their moral integrity. Yeah. What would they look like? They look like an absolute fool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'd be so easy to take advantage of. Right, right. Which is what happens to the person throughout the book. Exactly, yeah. right. So I think that like a a, a, a character like Priam falls right. into that. You know, he he um he ultimately falls a hook line and sinker for this for this trap. Right. And he he welcomes the horse into, yes. into the into the city and then it you know everybody knows what happens from right. uh, from there. But it also struck me as you know we're going to talk more and more about how I think Virgil wants us to read scenes against each other. Yes. So, you know, as Aeneas is telling the story of the Trojan horse, um, Ascanius is sitting on Dido's lap. You know, isn't Ascanius a kind of Trojan horse um, laying in wait for the Carthaginians? Oh, definitely. Right. So it's, it's Aeneas is going to, he's, he's bemoaning um, the story of the Trojan horse while playing a role in right. which that very same kind of thing is happening right as he's talking. Although Aeneas is not party to it. He's not party to he it. He doesn't know about the deception. It's entirely Venus's doing. Right. And that but, makes... but the other elements of comparison are definitely apt. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he doesn't know ab- about the trap, but it's the fact that it's happening mm-hmm. as he's telling the story. I think the the careful listener, the careful reader kind of recognizes, oh, there's another one of these wonderful uh, pairings that Virgil's doing. Right. Now, this is the only epic length treatment, isn't it, of mm-hmm. the fall of Troy that exists in all of Greco-Roman literature? Right. We get a little bit of the of the the horse story in the Odyssey mm. when Telemachus th- th- sorry, Telemachus goes to visit Helen and um Yeah, that's book Me- 4. Menelaus. Yep. And they kind of retell that story, but we here we get in this flashback, we get this extended treatment of the fall of Troy that uh, like we see in no other extant account. Right. What about Ovid's treatment in the Metamorphoses that we talked about? I mean, it's very. It, it takes up one whole line, though. It's remember? A, a whole line. It's a lengthy one line treatment. It's a huge line. Yeah. And so Troy <laughs> fell in with it, Priam. <laughs> right. Exactly. Thanks a lot, Ovid. Yeah. Yeah. Next. <laughs> yeah. So, um,. What, we, there's so much to cover here. Yeah, well, let's give a, just a quick breakdown of the book. Yeah, yeah, please. A kind of an outline. And here we're going to rely on the work of T.E. Good. 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 You trying to think of something funny to say? Yeah. Some cheesy remark? It's a, uh, there's so many uh, horrible puns that okay. to say there. I'm going to leave we'll it alone. It. Yeah. So the, the basic break, breakdown, thanks to T.E. Good, is The Wooden Horse. Then we go to Laokuan, the, the priest of Neptune, Sacerdos Neptuni. There's Sinon, the actor. And then we get the events inside Troy, right? Yeah. Which is Hector appearing to Aeneas in a dream. Aeneas then rushes into battle. We have the rape of Cassandra, the Trojan priestess, by Ajax Oileus, the monster. The death of Priam slaughtered at the altar. Brutal. Yes. And then Helen, the encounter with Helen. I think this is perhaps the most gripping aspect of the book. 
because he draws the sword and he says uh, to himself, you know, she is the cause of all of this. I'm going to kill her right now. Yeah. And he's filled with vengeance. Why doesn't he go through with it? Well, well, let's save that till we get to the right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Then Aeneas goes home to find Papa Anchises. I know having tea and crumpets or something like that. Loads him up on his shoulders, grabs his son Ascanius by the hand, and Creusa, as in the famous Barocci painting, Creusa is trailing behind. She's yeah. separated by a few feet from the entourage. And what happens to her? She dies. Oh, so we're going to spoil it right now? Well, we've already talked about that. We know she's okay, dead. Okay, right. okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then Creusa's ghost, he goes back to look for her. Creusa's ghost appears to him and says, it's too late. Yeah. Get, get out of Dodge. It's done. It's over. That's a pretty quick transition from dead to undead right there. It's, yeah. I, I give How long does it take? Well, usually there's at least some kind of process there. Do you there. think there's a waiting period it's like, between dying and appearing as a ghost? Well, Insta-ghost just to add water? <laughs> it, it's It's quick. But as you were describing that, I mean, it strikes me so much as um, Creusa as Eurydice, yeah, mm. Creusa as Lot's wife, right? Right. And, and that, that kind of that... Um, the left um, behind and the, therefore stranded. Therefore stranded, therefore lost forever. Mm. Yeah. And of course, the book ends with Troy abandoned, mm-hmm. and uh, the whole thing is just going down in flames, and Neptune is taking his giant trident and overturning the very walls he built. It's gripping, exciting stuff. That's right. And then uh, leaves it to be buried uh, awaiting Schliemann. That's right. Hundreds, thousands of years later. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but we're only going to be able to kind of cover a slice of that today. Speaking of slice, Laokawan and his two sons come to a grisly end, don't they? They do. It's in my top ten. That's right. And speaking of grisly end, yeah? it's time for the ads. This episode of Ad Nauseam is brought to you by Ratio Coffee, Dave. I have something very exciting to report. Okay, let's hear it. My Ratio 8 arrived yesterday. Oh, sweet. You yes. upgraded from the 6 to the 8. It did. I haven't used it yet because okay. I, I had kind of one in the chamber with my 6. Right. Um, but my son and I... <laughs> That's a firearms <laughs> metaphor, isn't it? Uh, I, I was referring to my coffee was ready for the next day. Okay. That, okay right, yeah. But I opened it up with my son. And one of the first things he said, he goes, Dad, this looks like the Millennium Falcon. Oh, wow. And you can't pay for that kind of press. I did. And I pulled it out by my walnut-accented handles oh, sweet. and the heft. and weight. It's a beautiful thing. Dad, right? this looks like the Millennium Falcon. Yeah. Now, I've seen yours. Yes. But there's nothing about nothing like taking your own eight out of the box and getting it set up. That's right. So, so you got it set up. Mm-hmm. You haven't used it yet. No. But you're looking forward to Tomorrow it. Tomorrow morning will be the inaugural run. Yep. You've got the hand-blown, um, what, what is it in Star Wars? Did the something run in eight parsecs or something? Oh, they did the Kessel run. The Kessel run. In in under eight parsecs. This, oh, yeah. Easily. That the, So the ratio eight will do that. Easily. Okay. Easily. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I was going to ask, mm-hmm. you've got the hand-blown borosilicate glass carafe. I do. That thing's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. Right. And mm-hmm. so it's... Uh, now, you, you're going to assure me that keeps it just as warm as my weighty terrine. No, it doesn't because I can't be dishonest. Okay. I'm the uh, the George Washington of coffee machines. Okay. If I chop down the cherry tree, I have to tell you. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't keep it warm. You have to you have to serve it right away. Okay. Or pour it into your hulking flagon. Ah, I gotcha. 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 All right. Okay. Yeah. So, well, there's clearly some things I need to learn. Oh there's, yeah. It's a whole it's a but, whole process. Here. But the learning curve is not steep. No. It's uh, what's the opposite of steep? Um, Gra- gradual. Gradually declining? No, no, no that's no, not it. No, it's not right. Yeah. Someone will call and tell us. So yeah. <laughs> it'll fix. And we'll give you a shout out. That's right. Because yeah. it still is just one press. You, yeah. You press one button and you go from bloom to brew. Don't forget the off gassing. Yep. And then ready. And it's ready. I, I can't wait to, to yeah. try this. Yeah. So you've got walnut accents. Mm-hmm. And what is what is the main body of the Millennium it Falcon? It is stainless steel. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it's, and just kind of moving it from the table to my countertop. It was, you know, I, I needed some extra hands. It right. Was a, you, could, you could feel how impressive this machine was. There was uh, heft. There was definite heft. Lots of heft. And how does Mrs. Winkle feel about the new addition to the family? She's very excited. Right. She's very excited. Yep. She says, oh, this is going to look great. And, Wonderful. Yep. And then I think you're gonna you're gonna regift the six to someone. We're not sure what to do with it. I mean, that's it's it's a beautiful, wonderful machine too. But um, yeah. well, don't put it up, you know, in a yard sale or something like that. Oh no, of course not. Because then someone's gonna score big time. Big time. No, right. no, no, no. Exactly. It might find its way down into into, into the into the studio downstairs. Oh, sweet. So, you know, some late night. Uh, you know, coffee on every level. Exactly. Right. Right. So, so what if our loyal audience wants to participate in this 
some of this coffee goodness? What should they, they, they do? Want, they want one, a six or the eight. They can go to ratiocoffee.com. They can uh, choose their whatever they want. They can type in the 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 code. Uh, this time it is A N C O eight nine. Yes, A N C O eighty nine. And that will be the code that will be effective throughout June of this year. That's right, through June thirty. Back in the summer of eighty nine, that was the best coffee of our lives. That's right. Isn't that how it goes? Exactly. A N C O eighty nine. Eighty nine. Check it out. This episode is also brought to you, loyal audience member, by Hackett Publishing. H A C K E T T. Offices in. Cambridge, Ma, and Indianapolis Inn. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been, Hackett's been with us since the beginning. Right. Um, Dave and I have talked uh, a lot about our use of their particular text. The That's L- right. The Lombardo translation that we're using. Yes. Um, of the Aeneid. Of the Aeneid. Of the Iliad. Of the Odyssey. Yes. That guy is just a machine of a machine. fine translations. Yes, and he has found a home at Hackett Publishing. That's right. right. So, um, great translation, wonderful cover. I, look great. I love the artwork. You see that um, that back photo of the Vietnam War Memorial from Washington, right. D.C. It's, it's so moving. Right. Um, and they got the Krizak, the new Len Krizak Aeneid translation. Just read a little bit of it. Uh, if you haven't read the Aeneid before, it's time. It's you know, it, it Read, is time. Reading yep. it in English can be a delightful experience when you have such great translations. Yeah. So whether you want a uh, kind of a prose-based translation, you want to have a more poetic translation, Hackett has, uh, I think, what you're looking for. That's right. And they have an enormous philosophy catalog as well, including the new Aristotle series. And they have Plato in several different translations of the Republic. They've really got everything. Tragedy, uh, Latin American studies, uh, Asian studies, Islamic studies. It's a really large catalog of high quality material. It's massive. So listeners go to hackettpublishing.com h a c k e t t publishing.com. Um take a take a um take a trip through their their catalog, find what you want, put it in your grocery basket, and if you type in the the code AN2022, you'll get 20% off. 20% off and free shipping. And free shipping. Don't delay. You really want to check this out. This episode is also brought to you by Pop City Popcorn. Our newest sponsor. That's right. Colonel Jeff. Yes. What do you like about Pop City Popcorn? I like the way that they have surprised me. Um, I think I've said before that when it comes to popcorn, I love popcorn, but I'm I'm pretty basic. You know, just pop pop it up, put some salt on it, maybe just a splash of butter, and that's fine. Put it in a five-gallon pail, wrap it around your neck, and go to town. Exactly right. Like the the, the feeding trough, right? That's where I was. And so that's where I've been for most of my life. And so when when we got the sampler from them, there were all these different flavors. I was very skeptical. You were a little bit skeptical. All right. And and I, I tried a little... Here and there, and um, the their two way drizzle yes. with the chocolate and the caramel. Um, the one that I loved is the the Parmesan cheese, um, and it was a uh, uh, and I think it was because they're actually they're using actual Parmesan cheese. That's right, not the powdered not industrial the powder. Right. You ever you ever look at a canister, a cylinder of Parmesan cheese that you might keep in your refrigerator? I have one in there right now. I do too. I have the large one. Yeah. You sprinkle it on your spaghetti and so forth. Yeah. One of the ingredients is cellulose. That's in there? You know what that is? Uh, uh, it's, it's sawdust. What's that doing in there? It's an anti-caking agent. <laughs> but I like cake. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they lace a little bit of cellulose through the Parmesan, because otherwise the Parmesan clings together. It's cellulose, i.e. sawdust. <sighs> None of that in Pop City. No, no, I, that can't be good for your. Products, no, I can't. I, no. I can't think so either. No, but uh, we're popcorn people, right? We are popcorn people, right? And popcorn people, where do they go? They go to Pop City Popcorn. That's right. Right, and so, they get such things as the two-way drizzle, mm-hmm. the uh, the Parmesan, the bacon cheddar. That was probably my favorite. That was your favorite. And there's also a really delicious uh, butter rum caramel. Mm. It tastes like real rum. Real rum. Yes, it does. Exactly. Who could put rum on popcorn? Exactly. You're never going to touch a box of the the, the Jacker Cracks again. No, right? no, 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 or, no. Or Orville brick and batter. <laughs> no, no way. You'll forget about those for good. Right. So, listeners, if you go to popcitypopcorn.com, uh, what is more? Dill right? pickle. Dill pickle. Remember, Mrs. Winkle especially liked the dill, dill pickle, pickle flavor. One. Exactly right. Yeah my, yeah, my boys went for that one, too. Yes, there's some great stuff. they got rainbow. I mean, the list goes on. Check out the website, you were just going to say. Yes, popcitypopcorn.com. Right. Dot com. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can go there, check it out, find what you like, um, and then if you put in the coupon code ANPOP. Uh, and two zero two zero a n p o p two zero. That's right. Okay. And pop twenty twenty. You're going to get twenty percent off your first order, which is pretty significant. Check it out. Throw some uh, in there. You're living the a n life, right? That's right. You're reading books. 
you're eating popcorn, you, maybe a napkin, throw it in there. Mm-hmm. Before you go back to the book, you're drinking delicious coffee. coffee. That's right. You, if you want to, if you want to do the trifecta, this is the this is the the third leg in the tripod. That's right. That's right. So don't delay. All right, Jeff, as we get back into it, we're at the Horus now, aren't we? Yes, we are. One of the most famous tricks, I think, in all of literature. Um, certainly, I think one of the most famous tricks associated with, with Odysseus. He's, um, he's the mastermind behind all of this. Yes. And so the Greeks have left this strange, large wooden horse on the shores outside the city walls of Troy. This is what the Trojans wake up to the next morning. Mm-hmm. And they notice that the entire fleet uh, that was there on the shores where the Greeks have been parked is completely gone. Yeah, they've sailed away behind the little nearby island, Tenedos. Tenedos, just around the corner. Correct. Yeah. Yep. And out of sight, out of mind. Right. And so the, the Trojans you know, are wondering, what is this strange thing? Um, could it really be that the Greeks have, have left? Um, there's all kinds of things running through their minds as they, as they see this, um, this strange item before them. And um, in comes Laocoon. Okay. This in one of the most, I think, uh, thrilling but also kind of disturbing episodes in this book, or if not the whole the whole epic. Right. But Laocoon is a Trojan priest. Yes. Um, usually associated with Neptune. That's right. And he comes running up uh, as the Trojans are wondering about these things, and he's and he Laocoon, he gets it. He says he figures it out. He figures it out. He, says, he was sacrificing a bull on the shore yes. that day, and as he was sacrificing, it was raising its horrible bellows toward the sky, mm-hmm. foreshadowing just a little bit for mooing. We could call it. <laughs> That's right. Probably the most famous example of for mooing. I think there's no doubt. <laughs> That's right. But he comes running up, and he says uh, to his his countrymen. Uh, are you crazy? Right. This is obviously a ruse. That's right. But let's. Would you read a little Latin? I'd here? I'd love it. And I'll I'll give a translation. All right. This is line forty. Primus eban tomnis magna cometanta caterva le ocoan arden suma de curdret abarca et procu o miseri quae tant insani aquiwes creditus a vectos hostis aut ulla putatis dona care redulis dana um sic notus ulexes. Very nice. Very nice. We didn't get to the thanks. It's so it's so much fun. Yeah. We didn't get to the part about uh, the Greeks bearing gifts. Do you want to keep, you want to keep going there? And, uh, and, yeah, maybe okay. we should. And I'll All give right. Lombardo's translation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Out hoc inclusi ligna cultandra kiwi, out haec in nostros fabricates machina muros, inspectura domos ventur draque de super urbi, out aliquis latet erdror equo ne credit et telgri, Quid quid it est timeo dane os et dona farentis. There's those famous lines. Yes. And, yes. And Lombardo translates uh, thusly. And now Lyokowan comes running down from the citadel at the head of a great throng. And in his burning haste, he cries from afar, Are you out of your minds, you poor fools? Are you so easily convinced that the enemy has sailed away? Do you honestly think that any Greek gift comes without treachery? What is Ulysses known for? Either this lumber is hiding Achaeans inside, or it has been built as an engine of war to attack our walls, to spy on our homes and come down on the city from above, or some other evil lurks inside. Do not trust the horse, Trojans. Whatever it is, I fear the Greeks, even when they bring gifts. No, that's really good. Right. That's really good. He, he's, he's such a great translator. Great translator. I just love how it's so, there's no, um, there's no middle ground here. Mm. The Elkowin says, you're out of your mind yes. if you think this is a good thing. Right. But then later on we'll be told, uh, you know, Virgil will tell us through the mouth of Aeneas that the gods blinded them that yeah. day. They just wouldn't listen to reason no matter what happened. Exactly. Troy was fated to fall. Right. And I love the detail of what happens next to this, you know, Lecoin's, uh exclamation point is he takes a spear, yep. chucks it at the horse where it sting, it, it sticks and, you know, right. you know, quivering in its side. And you know why it does that? Why does it do that? Because it's hollow. Right. If the horse were not hollow, the spear would not stick yeah. and it also would not vibrate. Yes. In all my experience, of throwing spears at wooden horses. Which is vast. Yes. The solid horses, the unfilled ones, the spear makes a dull thud and just falls. It's yeah. only when they're hollow that it lodges mm-hmm. and then vibrates back and forth. So it's another clue that they are yes. they're, they're blinded to. But they just they don't pay any attention. But I also love in in what happens to that one uh, fairly soon after this, uh, that the fact that he threw the spear at it is is interpreted again in, in, a, in the wrong manner. Right. This is the perversion of human thinking, which leads to the perversion of religious sacrifice. What uh, Rebecca Smith was talking That's about. That's correct. Article. Exactly right. 
So let's take it in a, a little different direction here. Oh, where are we going? Well, we're going to go to Yes Minister. What's that? That's a British comedy from uh, 1980 to 1984. And we have a lovely little clip here which deals with this uh, Trojan horse and uh, don't trust Greeks bearing gifts. You ever watched Yes Minister? I've heard of it, but I, oh, I, you're going to have to watch it now. I was yeah. always told, you know, I'm a, a fan of Monty Python. That's right. And I was always told that if you like the Python, oh. you'll love Yes Minister. Oh, this I would say this is far better because it's, it's much cleverer and there's just a war against bureaucracy. Oh, I Who like that. Who doesn't like a good war <laughs> against bureaucracy? It was written by Anthony Jay mm -hmm. and Jonathan Lynn. And Jay uh, was educated at St. Paul's School in Magdalen College, Cambridge. He graduated with first class honors in classics and comparative philology. So what we're about to listen to was actually written by a classicist, and I think it's just hilarious. Cue it up. Furthermore, Sir Mark thinks there may be votes in it. And if so, I don't intend to look a gift horse in the mouth. I put it to you, Minister, that you are looking at Trojan horse in the mouth. <laughs> if you look closely at this gift horse, you'll find it's full of Trojans. Uh, if you had looked at Trojan horse in the mouth, Minister, you would have found Greeks inside. <laughs> But the point is, it was the Greeks who gave the Trojan horse to the Trojans, so technically it wasn't a Trojan horse at all. <laughs> Hence the tag, to me, Danio set dona parentes, which you will recall, is usually and somewhat inaccurately translated as beware of Greeks bearing gifts, or doubtless you would have recalled had you not attended the LSE. <laughs> Yes, well, I'm sure Greek tags are all very well in their way, but can we stick to the point? Oh, yes. Sorry, yes. Sorry, Greek tags? Beware of Greeks bearing gifts. I suppose the EEC equivalent would be beware of Greeks bearing an olive oil surplus. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. No, I uh, think no well, the point is, Minister, that just as the Trojan horse was in fact Greek, what you describe as a Greek tag is in fact Latin. It's obvious, really. The Greeks would never suggest be wearing it themselves if one can use such a participle, be wearing, that is. And it's clearly Latin, not because Timio ends in O, because the Greek first person also ends in O. No, actually, there is a Greek word, Timao, meaning I honor. But the OS ending is a nominative singular termination of a second declension in Greek, and an accusative plural in Latin, of course. Though actually, Danios is not only the Greek for Greek, it's also the Latin for Greek. It's very interesting, really. <laughs> yes, I take your point, Humphrey, but is it really? <laughs> well, Minister, that. That is hilarious. Yeah, that's great, isn't it? It's great. I, uh, you know, I love comedy that expects something from its audience, yes. right? And so the fact that they're, they're, they're dropping this with talking about in, you know, indicative and accusatives, right. and numbers, right? it's it, as, you know, assuming kind of a knowledge of Latin. That's right. right? It's, it's so erudite. Yeah, there are also some funny references. Uh, I think uh, Jim Hacker, you know, the minister is named Hacker. Yeah. He says, well, you know, they say to him, you would have understood it if you didn't go to the LSE, which is the London <laughs> the School, School of Economics. That's right? correct, that's right. which is like the lowbrow. <laughs> Right. So, so these two guys, you know, the writers, you know, they're, they're Cambridge and Oxford credentials. They're making fun of others. And it, you're right. It expects someone of something of the audience. Right. And I like how they, they kind of break down is that, you know, the the, the what's the, the famous line that pe when people refer to this is um, don't trust Greeks bearing gifts or something. Right. Like that. Don't look a Trojan horse in the mouth. Right. Right. <laughs> right. right. But I like how he goes to the Virgil and says, that's not exactly what it says. Exactly. To Mayo, I fear, I'm right. afraid of, geek, of, of Greeks, even when they're, when they're bringing gifts. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So we need good. more things like that in pop culture, don't we? We do. Yeah. We do. We do. I think that, uh, I mean, we're not dumbing it down for the masses here. No, right? no. Right? No, exactly no. right. So I would love to see more of that, that yeah. kind of thing. So uh, that's wonderful. Well, what about the, the ethnic profiling that comes up next, though, what? with um, with Sinon? Uh, what, yeah, what, yeah, what's going on with Sinon here? I mean, they, where's the, where do you see the ethnic profiling? Well, at, at the moment, right, that there's some doubt, some hesitation. Are they going to bring the horse inside the city? The Greeks have a backup plan because they are so shrewd. They anticipated this idea, right? Yeah. We leave the horse there, but what if the Trojans don't fall for the ruse? How are we going to get that horse inside? So the backup plan is this Greek actor named Sinon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And here's the ethnic profiling. It's on line 65 and 66. Akipanunk dana insidiasit kriminabuno discomnis. So this is Virgil. I'm sorry, this is Aeneas. Telling Dido and his Carthaginian audience, okay, you can in one in one glimpse you can figure out the whole Greek race. He says, receive now Akipanunk the treachery of the Danaeans, and from one crime, crimen ab uno, learn all of them, all Greeks, right? All yeah. Danaeans. 
They're tricky, deceptive, obnoxious, wicked people. And you can learn it all from this one guy, Sinon. So Sinon, it, he stands in for the for the whole. The whole yeah. race. He's yeah. the quintessential tricky Greek. And that's a kind of ethnic profiling, isn't it? It is. Yeah. De- definitely. Right. Are you I, comfortable I, with that? I, I'm, I, Aeneas seems to be comfortable with it. It I wasn't think, the question, Dr. Winkle. I think I think to answer that question, you have to put yourself in Aeneas' shoes. Okay. Right. What Let's he's gone through, put, what's happened to his Put city, yourself in his sandals. Right? What happens? I think that you, he sees how the fortunes of his city, his family turned on what this man did or, or you know this man with you know Ulysses kind of coaxing and you know, pushing up from behind um, I could I understand that anger okay I understand from a broad a broad perspective so, well, how can you judge an entire you know right. race of people on, on one person but I think you would consider what this man went through and right. what he's lost I understand it yeah even if I w- if I were to you know tut tut a little bit from my, right from my high couch that's right, right? <laughs> <laughs> Toro ab alto yeah but of course, also the the rest of the Greeks were implicit in this trickery. Sinon mm-hmm. is just their representative; he's the actor, but everyone is uh, involved in it. Right. But I think you know, any Roman listening to this would also, you know, Rome. One of the things Rome, of course, is famous for is its deep love of Greek culture yes. and art and architecture and philosophy. So uh, maybe there's a, a bit of kind of a, a chip on the shoulder here. Definitely. So you know the, that what's the what's Horace's famous line? Is, you know, the Rome captured Greece, but was in turn it was in turn captured um, by, by Greece. By Greece. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's always that Roman um, kind of you know it's wariness. Wariness. Mm-hmm. Uh, they 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 love Greek culture, but they kind of hate that they love Greek culture. Right. So maybe that's all mixed into this too. There's a fly in the ointment. Yeah, yeah. So the Sinon character, he um, he shows up. Uh, kind of bedraggled and, and dirty and... Um, Hands tied behind his back. Yes, right. So he looks like he's just run. He's escaped from something, uh, it seems clear. And he he runs up and he claims that he was targeted by the Greeks. Right, and by Odysseus in particular. Right. And so the, he says that, well, uh, he reminds us that you know, for the fleet to sail to Troy, that involved a human sacrifice. If right. a uh, Agamemnon had to sacrifice his own daughter. Yeah, at Aulis. In, in, and in so doing, sells the seeds for his own destruction upon his return. Um, and they, uh, the Greeks are kind of saying, what do we do? How long are we going to stay here? How do we get out of this? They consult the oracles. Calchas, the priest of Apollo, is involved again. And Sinon claims he receives an oracle that says, you had to get here with a human sacrifice. You got to leave with a human sacrifice. That's right. And so the question becomes then, who gets to be the sacrifice? Right. And th- Odysseus really pushes it through against signing claims. He looked at me. Right. And so. Uh, and the reason is there was some old enmity between them. Right. And so he's Odysseus is settling a score. Right. Right. And the whole theory is that the how does it go? The uh, enemy of my friend. Right. The enemy of my. F- no, no, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> How does how does that how does that phrase go? Fool me once, blame on you. <laughs> Fool me twice. The the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yes. That's how it goes. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. So yes. the enemy of Odysseus is Sinon, and the enemy of the Trojans is Odysseus. Yes. Therefore, Sinon and the Trojans should be friends. Yes. That's the whole basis of the argument. Right. So if the story of Laocoon and the sacrifice is a perversion of religious ritual, then the story of Sinon is a perversion of Xenia, yes. or guest friendship, right? Right. It's another overturning of this sacred this sacred thing. What do you mean by that? Say more. Well, I, so um, I, to refer to the Odyssey once again, I think that if you had to pick kind of one governing moral principle that you see threaded throughout the entire Odyssey is this idea of Xenia. How do hosts treat guests in particular, and, and to some degree how guests um, behave under the um, the aegis of a of, of a host, and that's a sacred that's a sacred bond. Um, it goes back to you, know, you don't know if Zeus is the is the person disguised at your doorstep, the god of right. of, of this um, you know, this hospitality of guest friendship. Yeah, don't we have an episode about that? We do. Yeah, yeah. We, we way back when. Yeah, Ovid, uh, Bacchus, and Philemon. Yes, yeah, exactly. Jupiter and um, Mercury. Right. So that's exactly the thing we're talking about here. So Sinon is is again, he's playing upon. I think he's he 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 knows kind of that naive, um, sympathetic nature of the Trojans. He's playing on that, but he's also like you were just saying, he's playing on the fact that uh, the Trojans also know that Odysseus is their is their deep enemy. Yeah, they hate him, and so they, that lends a certain sympathy there as well. And so he's asking for kind of ultimate Xenia, um, you know, protection 
uh, from his the enemy that he describes. Right. He's it's a supplication. He's falling on his knees. He's kind of he's he's throwing away everything and just begging for mercy. Yeah. It's kind of exact that extreme act of of uh, supplication. That's extreme act of of zania of of grace clemency. Mm-hmm. Um, he's doing this all under these false pretenses, and then that's that's a that's a moral crime. And that's how you can judge all the race from just this one man, yeah, criminal right. uno. Right. So how does Sinan get away? Why wasn't he? You know, if if the tale is true, mm-hmm. what additional lies does he tell about his escape? Well, he says that um, the you know they were preparing the the uh, the ritual. Why don't I just read Lombardo's translation at this at this okay. at this point? So um, he's talking about it's the kind of the moment or the the day of the, the sacrifice is, is is here. He says, and now the dark day dawned. The salted grain, the sacral headbands were being prepared for my ritual slaughter. When I confess, I broke my bonds and snatched myself from death. I skulked all night in a muddy swamp. It kind of reminds me of Go- Gollum. Here, yeah. Almost, right? <laughs> Hidden in the sedge, holding my breath until they sailed. Now I have no hope of seeing my homeland, my sweet children, the father I long for. Oh, he's really laying on oh, thick, big isn't time, he? Right. He, oh, he's chewing the scenery, as they say. Yeah. And the Greeks may make them pay for my escape, poor things, and by their death expiate my sin. Oh, so the Greeks are going to kill his family when they get home. Even. Right. Exactly. And so I think that I think that's so interesting is that you know they receive this oracle you know there must be a human sacrifice for you to leave troy and they sail away without doing it mm-hmm. so it's again he's kind of well because they couldn't find him well his success so was, you choose another guy i guess but, so you're noticing some potential weaknesses in the story i think that and again i think that it's uh, it speaks to kind of tro- the trojan naivete mm-hmm. but it also i think he's saying that the greeks they receive this oracle from the gods and they end up eh what are you going to do? Yeah. We'll just kill a bunch of people when we get home. Okay. And so it, it, it's, he's throwing shade at the Greeks once again. Got it. Which may, again, make the Trojans say, oh, yeah, I get what you're saying. I, I th- I'm feeling that. I thought you were about to put together two words in a portmanteau. Uh, it, w- Trojan and naivete. Troyogete. Troyogete. Oh, I like I that. I think you were about to do that. I have to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think... Um, I think we got to stop there. We pretty much do because we're running really low on time, aren't we? Low on we? time, and, and so we'll start next the next episode with Is, the, the death of uh, of Leo oh, well, I was going to say, does Leoko one survive? Well, of course not. He dies. He famously dies in this yes. in this grisly way. And we're going to have some time to talk about the beautiful Leoko one group, which mm-hmm. was unearthed in at the beginning of the 16th century. Yes, in Italy, and it's in the Vatican Museum. Yes, on prominent display. It's, yes. it's it's incredible. It's fantastic, and we'll tell a little bit of that story. Maybe reserve the rest of it for a gurgle. That would be great. Yep. But we're up against the clock, and we got to get out of here. That's right. But before we go, Dave, tell us a little bit about the Moss Method. Yeah, so the Moss Method is a program I have developed for learning ancient Greek, both the classical or Attic variety, as well as Homer, if you'd like and the New Testament, which is an interest of many of our audience members. Mm -hmm. So you go to mossmethod.com, check out all of the free instruction I have there. If you like my method of teaching, my approach, watch the first lesson. You can sign up for the whole course. It's $325, module one, 40 lessons, 40 videos, uh, 40 homework assignments. If you like home, who doesn't like homework? Of course, yeah. <laughs> you got to go through the parsing and so forth to really learn the language. It will take you from... Neophyte to erudite. Thank you, Jeff. Yes. Yeah, and uh, they also get the Moffis Hours. Moffis Hour, direct contact with you. Yes, once per week we meet, we get together. There were about uh, six or seven of us this last Friday, and we uh, read some Greek together, answered some questions. Uh, I think we looked a little bit at the uh, the Gospel of Mark. In the past, we have looked at Plato, we've looked at Sophocles, at Homer. We've really uh, run the gamut. Fantastic. MossMethod.com. That's right. All right, we got some people to thank. Yeah, we want to thank, uh, first of all, Mishka, our sound engineer. As always, she does such a great job, makes us sound so much better than we actually are. Yeah, and you know, when we started, Mishka told me recently, you know, she said, uh, when you guys started doing this, you know, I didn't have a lot of experience as a sound engineer. You know, I was... I was uh, really good at video and so forth. I mean, she's too modest to say that, but yeah. it's true. She did a lot of that kind of work. But I said, hey, can you can you engineer a podcast? She didn't bat an eye. She just, okay, I'll do it. And uh, now the sound quality is fantastic. It's fantastic. Boy, I would not have guessed that she didn't have much experience with that at all. She did yeah. such a nice job. Yeah, learned so quickly. Uh, thanks, as always, to Scott Van Zen and Ken Tamplin for the great music you hear throughout the, the podcast. Yeah, the guitar, yeah. screaming guitar. Yeah. Uh, Ken Tamplin, vocalacademy.com or Scott Van zen.com if you want to learn how to sing or to play like that they're the real deal yeah for yes. sure yeah um 
And um, if you want to, if you want a shout out, come on. Yeah, come on. Drop a note to Dave at Dave at Don't forget that V. Or Jeff at AdNauseum.com. Don't forget the V. Maybe you'd like to pick up a t-shirt. We've got the uh, yeah. Ad Nauseam themed t-shirts. We also have a great one based on a quote from Erasmus, Quai no Kent, do Kent. Yes, that which, uh, that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's right. Broadly, I mean, uh, broadly. Yeah, what well, yeah. doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. So what are we going to do for uh, next week, episode 86? We're going to pick it up and probably make it through another what like 13 lines of book two <laughs> maybe 12 no we're gonna start you don't want to miss it because we're starting uh with the layout going episode that's which is, right which is one of the great ones but we're gonna continue to make our way through dave's favorite book that's right the Aeneid, book yeah. two. yes yep. and dave you're gonna close this out today with a gustatory parting shot yes here we go this is from sunday Adalaya, who says god did not just create you to be a nice person and eat hamburgers until you die <laughs> I love it. I love it. But that would be pretty good, wouldn't it? It wouldn't be too bad. Yeah, thanks. We could relish in it. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Thanks.